and spent, I don't know, maybe 20 years or 25. more, 25 years <laughs> uh, at CMU. Uh, he's made seminal contributions to IC circuit design, in particular on the analog side. And uh, some of his work actually uh, made it into a startup company that was then later acquired uh, by Cadence. And uh, Rob uh, was instrumental, I don't know if you were the main person, but he was instrumental in getting a $100 million gift um, at Illinois uh, for big data research. So at this point, uh, they have an institute and they have a number of chairs and they will have fellowships for students and the like uh, to do work in uh, big data. So please welcome Rob. Thank you. I, it, you know, as, Thank you. Um, I really wish I could take credit for the, for the gift, but you know, this is one of those things where you have trained professionals uh, you know, working on stuff. Um, so thanks so much for the, um, for the opportunity to come. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, kind of what's going on in the Big Data University of Illinois, um, since that's actually kind of sort of how I got invited um, to this. But then uh, actually respecting the topic of the conference, let me talk a little bit about um, you know, how big data might actually touch something in the wireless universe. So I'm actually going to talk a little bit about mHealth. And we've, had, we've seen a couple of, of, of sort of teaser you know, things about mHealth up to now. So let, let me go into that in a little more detail. Um, you know, just a little bit of history. Um, you know, we've been doing the big iron thing at, uh, at Illinois for, for years and years. Um, it's kind of, you know, culturally where we've, where we've been. And I know that, you know, U UT is also another place that has, you know, lots of chops in the supercomputing business. Um, this is Blue Waters, the machine that just came online this year. This is the US Track 1 system. It's about 800,000 cores. It's the largest machine owned and operated by any university on the planet. They had to rewire central Illinois to make this thing actually work. You know, it's 20 megawatts. Um, you know, a couple of football fields. And one of the things that's interesting is where the sort of the big iron universe starts to meet the big data universe. I mean, we're starting to see, you know, lots of interesting results. Let us remember that a supercomputer has lots of interesting things, but one of them is it has one and a half petabytes of DRAM, right? So you can do some really interesting stuff in this universe. This is just a lovely recent result. This is, um, if you didn't know it, the HIV capsid. So this is the sort of the external protein coat on an HIV molecule. Um, which until this result, people didn't really exactly know what it looked like. This is a 100 million atom simulation, right? This is, you know, molecular dynamics at the sort of the bleeding edge of what is, of what is physically possible. The big result is that they actually figured out what it looks like. It got the cover of nature. The big reason it got the cover of nature is they think they found a, a vulnerability that may be exploitable by drugs, All right? So this is just a very interesting um, result in, you know, the big iron meets big data universe and an interesting way in which people like Sanjay Kalei, the guy on the left who's a computer scientist, can hang with sort of serious uh, biology oriented people like Klaus Schulten who does the, you know, the kind of the biology side of this. Um, now, um, we've been doing the big data stuff as well as the big iron stuff for a long time. So this is the obligatory brag slide, right? So, you know, Mark and Eric, you know, went off and did, did Mosaic and then did Netscape. You know, Mark's off basically disrupting in the venture capital universe. Eric actually lives down the block in Champaign. Um, Tom Siebel more or less invented customer relationship management CRM stuff when he started Siebel Systems. Um, Javed and Steve started YouTube. They're off doing a couple of new companies now. Peng started Match.com. He's off doing venture capital right now. Um, Max and Luke started PayPal. Um, Max is off doing Affirm, which is the sort of the thing after, after PayPal. Um, Ross and a couple of other guys went off and started Yelp. So um, it's been an interesting, one of the most interesting parts of my job is, uh, as, the, as the CS head is that I actually get to go hang with some of these people. So this is, this is, this is fun. So I get to talk to people doing things and sort of disrupting data universe quite, quite frequently. And as, I, um, as was uh, mentioned in my introduction, the sort of the newest and most interesting disruption at the school up north is this thing called the Granger Engineering Breakthroughs Initiative. So we got $100 million from the Granger Foundation um, to the College of Engineering at Illinois. There's 30 plus endowed chairs, a bunch of other kinds of stuff for big data and bioengineering. That's the cool thing. This is the largest gift to any public university in uh, 2012 and 2013. So who writes a check for $100 million? Right, um, his son. <laughs> okay, so this is William Wallace Granger, um, who got a degree in electrical engineering in 1919. Um, his uh, undergrad degree was interrupted by WW1. Interestingly enough, um, he served in both world wars, and in 1927 he founded WW Granger. And what's really interesting um, is uh, is this this thing right here. In the 1930s, that's what big data looks like. 
right? Because that's actually something called the motor book. And if you were doing something on the bleeding edge of technology in the 1930s, which meant that you were doing something with electricity, okay, and you needed parts, that's where you went. That was the resource, like the Sears catalog was the thing you needed if you needed something in your house. If you were building something involving a motor, right, or something, that's where you were. That's where you went. And that became a gigantic multi-billion dollar company today that has a website and is still sort of the go-to place for lots of stuff in the machinery universe. Um, and uh, his son is a, a humongous um, University of Illinois fan. Um, and they gave us $100 million to work on, on big data and, and, and some other things. Now, since we have $100 million, I am contractually obligated to sort of explain a few facts to you. Okay, so the first thing is to remind you that I have 30 endowed chairs. Actually, I have 35 endowed chairs, but that, that felt like bragging. I have 30 plus endowed chairs. We are less than 1,000 miles away, okay? <laughs> And even better than that, we are in the same time zone. So you do not have to change your DVR or anything, right? You know, I mean, almost everybody you know lives in either Eastern or Pacific time. No, really, you know, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's exactly the same thing. And for anyone who might actually be interested in chatting with me, you can stop listening now. Anyone who's interested in chatting with me, the other thing that I will, I will, I will, I will observe is you can keep all your orange stuff, uh, okay? So. I will, be, I will be pleased to, to, uh, to have conversations with anyone in a, in a highly confidential manner later uh, over, over dinner. Um, let me actually talk about something that's sort of relevant to the, you know, to, to, to the substance of, um, of the session. Let me talk a little bit about mHealth. So I just went to, the, you know, to Wikipedia and said, all right, what do they say? mHealth, also written with a hyphen. Actually, I never see it written with a hyphen. Um, or mobile health is a term used for the practice of medicine and public health supported by mobile devices. So this is just the notion that everybody's going to have a tablet. Everybody's going to have you know, some high-end cell phone. Um, people may be having watches. You know, it may be possible that some of this kinds of functionality is going to be migrating you know, in-body, on-body jewelry and things like that. In this hyper-connected universe of incredible sensors and computers, you know, what kind of stuff is, is, is going to happen in the medical universe? So there's a really interesting evolving universe that's just, you know, we're just starting to see stuff just starting to happen. So this is Fitbit, which is, you know, a reasonably famous, you know, kind of a company. It is no surprise at all that these kinds of appliances that monitor things started in the kind of the elite performance athlete, you know, universe. So if you've ever read anything about the quantified self, you know, and people who measure every aspect of their, of their motion and their mobility and calories in and byproducts out, you know, and things like that, there are people who track these things in a very aggressive, in a very aggressive manner. So no surprise that this started with athletes, right? Now, anybody in this room do a triathlon? Anybody run a marathon? Anybody sleep? Okay, what's really interesting about, I know, we're all busy, we're faculty, right? Mo only half of the hands went up. Um, what's really interesting is that these things are migrating from their source in the sort of the elite performance athlete universe into a wellness universe of sort of ordinary sort of, you know, day-to-day -day functional monitoring of aspects of people's health. That's really interesting. We're starting to see things being built into appliances to enable these and some, you know, some other kinds of things. So this is the M7 chip. This is the motion coprocessor in the new iPhone 5S, right? Um, it is extremely expensive if one wants to be monitoring something on an every second basis or an every minute basis of any of the sort of the motion things that can be measured um, with the inertial stuff on the iPhone to be waking up the gigantic A7 chip all of the time to be processing that. Better to make a smaller chip on the side in a less aggressive technology. I think this is like 180 nanometers for people who know what that is as opposed to like 22, right, which is, which is the A7, to be able to track that stuff, to be able to enable applications of this type. Now, this is, uh, that's actually the, the, uh, the vice president of marketing, Phil Schiller, for, you know, for Apple. Um, this is a gigantic big deal uh, for a variety of reasons. Do you have any idea how constrained the physical footprint and space and volume inside a cell phone is? Right, the willingness to sort of dedicate space to doing something like this suggests that you know, tracking this kinds of stuff is going to be hugely important. Now, for you know, possibly advertising and all kinds of purposes, but you know, second by second and minute by minute tracking is what this thing is what this thing enables. It enables applications like this, right? This is the Nike Move app. Right. Um, it's an application for the five, uh, you know, the, the, the phone. Um, Nike has had a variety of iPhone apps that measure things, but able to do so at much less acuity, you know, much less accuracy, much less frequently because 
you know, I usually try to make sure that I turn my mapping stuff or my GPS stuff on my phone off when I'm done using it because otherwise it's going to really blow through the battery rather quickly. You know, now with something like M7, you can actually be monitoring these things kind of, sort of, all the time without worrying about it. So interesting landscape. Um, now, how do, you know, these things sort of um, become relevant in the, the health information technology universe? So let me just talk about, sort of, you know, a couple of big things that are happening um, in the health IT universe that this stuff plays into. So the first is there's going to be increasing accountability in healthcare. So one of the things that the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare, um, makes possible are ACOs, accountable care organizations, right, where you get paid based on results and not how many colonoscopies, right, you do, right? So more evidence-based outcomes, less fee-for-service kinds of stuff. So in the universe of, of uh, you know, data, possibly more data. You know, people measuring stuff and caring about what the data says. There are changes in where healthcare is delivered. I mean, there's a lot of push to move toward more outpatient, um, more well-patient care kinds of things, you know, less inpatient, less hospitalization, less classical doctor's office. As we all know, the least eff effective, least expensive way, I'm sorry, the least uh, cost-efficient way of delivering health care is to show up at the emergency room and say, oh, 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 I have a splinter, right? Really, really bad. So we're going to see more health care, more locus of health care, sort of, you know, local to where you are. When health is monitored, there's a lot of push to have more continuous, continuous monitoring of uh, conditions and behaviors, especially things that have, you know, kind of a long-term chronic behavior. You know, people with certain kinds of diabetes, you know, are you monitoring your blood pressure? Are you monitoring your blood sugar? Are you monitoring results from your chemotherapy, right? You know, to the extent that it's possible to have these things exist as various sensing devices that you can hang on your person or, you know, close to you, um, we're going to see more of this stuff being delivered all the time as opposed to having to drive someplace and get this stuff done. How health is monitored? Well, obviously, it's the rise of mobile appliances, you know, so the, the cell phone in my pocket, the tablet um, in my briefcase, you know, possibly the watch on my arm or maybe a sort of a jewelry item of some kind. Um, measuring things, and in this, in this proposed universe, um, taking some of the appropriate data, distilling it in an appropriate way, and shooting it out into the cloud so that people um, in the healthcare universe can actually interrogate that, do deep dives on sort of long temporal runs of data, and can say useful, useful things. Now, what are the new concerns that, that happen as a result? Well, the gigantic new concern, you know, the thing that has everybody very worried, the thing that is in many cases one of the most significant obstacles are trust and security issues of, of, of you know, very, very sensitive data. Right? You're worried about what Google knows about your browsing habits. Are you less worried about Google, what Google knows about your blood pressure? So it's just sort of a high-level overview of what the emerging health ecosystem uh, might, might actually look like. So suppose you are sitting with your extremely expensive haircut and your fabulous clothes and your fabulous architectural digest chair right, in front of um, a green screen for whatever, whatever reason. Okay, and you're sitting there and you're looking at your, at your phone and uh, consulting on your health status, right? Because there are a whole bunch of sensors that are perhaps, you know, on your person, on your belt, in your pocket, you know, on your phone, in the chair, right, whatever, that are sensing and measuring things and probably communicating those things to your, you know, to your phone. And perhaps even some actuation, you know, which is to say maybe you're, you're calibrating the measurement or you're, or you're adjusting something, right? Those things are being communicated probably to your phone because they probably don't have the power budget to be sort of actually connected cellularly to the, you know, to the network. That's going to be a, use your phone to sort of connect to some cellular infrastructure of some kind, you know, whether, and there's interesting debates about whether there's going to be something that looks like a, you know, a set-top box in your house or an Apple TV that's sort of the aggregator for this data in part because of the privacy issues or whether it's just going to sort of use your phone or your tablet and sort of go out on sort of either Wi-Fi or the cellular network. And that's going to get communicated out to the cloud because there's going to be data monitoring constantly. You're not going to be able to store enough of this stuff. People are going to want to be doing some large-scale you know, you know, data mining on, on, on your data. Um, there's something in this universe called secondary um, uses. Um, secondary uses are um, if you give permission, people can aggregate lots of data and can go mining lots of people right, and hopefully look for patterns across populations. Right. If, you, if you opt in and you let people do that sort of thing and possibly find that, you know, everybody who takes this sort of medicine and has this sort of, uh, you know, kind of health status has this bad effect and we need to alert you to that. 
right? What's going to happen? Somebody else with a mobile appliance is going to consume that data, right? They're going to go to the cloud. They're going to interrogate something about your health status. And hopefully, um, you know, someone with a physician's, you know, kind of a background is going to be able to look at that data and tell you something useful, right? But, you know, perhaps you also just want to sort of enable some people in your family, right? So, Grandma, did you fall again, right? Is an entirely reasonable you know, sort of a, you know, sort of a monitoring kind of a, kind of a solution, especially in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, as the boomers start to retire and get old, right? This is, this is something that people talk about all the time. Um, you know, how does this affect the, you know, the sort of the wireless universe? Um, imagine that, you know, everybody has, you know, several appliances that are all monitoring continuously, generating large amounts of data and sending these things out into the cloud, right? This is a gigantic amount of data. Now, one of, the, one of the questions, or, or if you will, the pushbacks that sometimes happens, you know, when you sort of you show this slide is people say, uh, you know, so, you know, you measure a number every minute, and, you know, and you shoot a, you know, a 16-bit, you know, int out on the wireless network. You know, that's not that big a deal. So here's just an interesting data point from the medical universe. It is estimated that only about 20% of the factors that correlate strongly with lifespan, right, are measured regularly for people who visit their doctor once or twice a year. Said differently, 80% of the stuff that can kill you is not measured often enough, right? Which is why people who are interested in health outcomes are very interested in what ginormous amount of data is possibly going to be acquired, aggregated, pushed over some wireless links and put in the cloud for subsequent, you know, uptake and analysis. Even more interesting maybe is that control might be coming back. And, you know, what control means is, I mean, control sounds like a really harsh thing. So, I mean, we're a ways away from your cardiac surgeon sitting on the beach in Monaco with his iPad saying, uh, let's dial Mr. Rutenbar's pacemaker up a little bit because I don't know what he's doing. He's in Austin, and he seems a little nervous. So you know, maybe we dial it down a little bit. You know, um, we're a ways away from that. But you know, imagine that one is calibrating the sensors. Imagine that one is um, doing something along the lines of of, uh, of persuasion, right? So I mean, I mean, if you're tracking, you know, food intake, it is not at all unreasonable that you know your iPhone kind of buzzes and lights up and says, "Put down the Big Mac," <laughs> right? I mean, we're not that far away from, you know, from those sorts of things. Now. You know, what are the problems in this universe? Well, uh, you know, we had, we had a, a one recent panel where someone, you know, several people said, well, and security is always the last thing people think about. Um, yeah, um, but security and trust issues are one of the first things that people are thinking about here because of all of the, you know, the HIPAA certification kinds of things. There are gi gigantic um, uh, worry points, right, on, uh, on the trust universe here. Who is okay to see your health data, right? What happens when it leaks? How do we prevent it, you know, from leaking? What purposes are people allowed to use, you know, your data for? If people are using your data without your permission for some sort of a study that's going to lead to some sort of a drug treatment, do you get a piece of that action, right? I mean, lots and lots and lots of interesting questions um, not exactly resolved. Um, it's not at all a small problem. So one of the cool things that just happened is, is uh, Illinois is part of the big NSF Frontiers Award, 10 million bucks, to go look at this stuff. So there's a website, trustworthyhealthandwellnessthaw.org. Um, David Colts of Dartmouth is uh, the lead on that one. This is sort of my acknowledgement slide. So David, Carl Gunter, Claire Narstead, and Roy Campbell from, from Illinois are the people who sort of, you know, prepped um, all of the kind of the interesting stuff. So it's Dartmouth, Illinois, Hopkins, Michigan, and Vanderbilt. Interesting big universe of problems. I mean, imagine, you know, the sorts of trust issues that happen here and how those things might actually manifest themselves in sort of technology kinds of impacts. So, you know, you just, you know, had cancer and you were in the middle of your chemo and you go home to some home health care kind of scenario and in some future your, cardio your, uh, your oncologist is in fact on the beach at Monte Carlo, right, and she has her iPad, you know, and she's sort of, you know, looking at, at what's happening and she's sort of communicating sort of backwards through this channel, Mrs. Smith, oh, your chemo results are such and such, but you forgot on the setting on your chemo monitoring app on your iPhone, you know, to turn off the push notifications and suddenly your family knows that you have cancer, right? Um, the leakage scenarios here are really, really worrisome to people. I mean, it's, it's um, or if you will, when sort of good people are trying to do good things, right, one of the big concerns is sort of leakage, that things just get out in the open into places that, you know, you don't want them to get. So, 
what happens to your employment status? You know, what happens to, well, at least in the modern universe, as of about a month ago, your insurance status doesn't mean it gets canceled, but the rates you might pay might become, might become problematic. I mean, there's all kinds of problems in this universe. Um, so, you know, this is sort of the, what happens when good people are trying to do good things with gigantic amounts of monitored M health data flowing around? But there are, there are other, you know, hard, you can't read that, you know, very complex things. So, you know, what happens when you're sitting on the couch one evening, you know, and your cell phone, you know, kind of goes off and your insulin pump sends you a note that says, sorry, can't regulate your insulin right now, fending off denial of service attack from the pacemaker. <laughs> All right? Um, there are interesting results in the universe of hacking pacemakers, you know, externally with sort of, you know, various electromagnetic kinds of attacks. Now, this is the far-fetched, you know, kind of minority report, you know, end of the spectrum of, um, of bad things. The sorts of things that people really deeply worry about um, in this universe um, are people stealing your health identity, right? So one of the things that's a real concern in this universe is people monitoring you right, and hacking your appliance or your cloud or whatever and stealing your health identity for the purposes of making fraudulent claims against your health provider, right? And so, um, you know, as anyone, as anyone who's ever had their credit card hacked, right, I have a very clear memory of the phone call from, you know, Bank of America saying, Mr. Rutenbar, we're just checking to just to make sure. Um, that spa vacation for two in Moscow, um, How's that going? <laughs> right? And uh, as it turned out, unfortunately, I was not in Moscow having anyone put hot rocks on me. Um, you know, what happens when you, 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 know, you get the phone call from your, from your insurance company saying, we're so sorry, um, how's the artificial leg doing? So um, we've actually been at this for a while at Illinois. This is actually a, a surprisingly wide, you know, kind of a national, you know, kind of area of research. Um, just kind of an example. Um, in 2010, there were actually four HHS centers that were awarded from stimulus money. So there's all kinds of interesting places the stimulus money went. So this was, uh, this was ARRA money. And so there was an interesting um, um, effort from uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services called the Strategic Health Advanced Research Projects effort. And they put together a bunch of big centers, uh, like $15 million a center, for work on electronic medical records. Because one of the things that's true, and I think we saw this in uh, Paris slides, um, you know, it's, it is on, the, the, the medical universe is um, astonishingly um, not integrated not uniform in terms of the sort of the data formats. Has anyone has ever gone to one doctor and been referred to a specialist and gone to the other specialist and had 800 pages of stuff faxed, right, to the other specialist who then didn't exactly read it, right, and asked you the same 600 questions again? Um, the universe of data for how hospitals store their electronic records, how they move from one specialty to another, how they move from one enterprise to another, and there's nothing remotely like sort of you know, robust standards for how people do it and how the security and privacy is protected. There were four big centers awarded to sort of work on all of those kinds of problems, and one of them was Mayo, and one of them was Harvard Medical School, and one of them was UT Health Science Center at, Austin, at Houston, and the other was the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois. Right, so it's the only non-medical school that was actually, you know, kind of brought into there, which just suggests that the sort of the big data side of this stuff, and especially the security and privacy and trust aspects of that big data, of all of the data surrounding health, and especially we think going forward with mobile health, right, with data not just coming when you show up in the emergency room or in the outpatient care, right, or in the, or in the hospital, but when your cell phone is continuously monitoring stuff, it's a really interesting universe to be working on, likely to have some disruptive effects in this universe. So um, let me just conclude with a very sort of a high-level slide. You know, in the mHealth universe, it's generally estimated, and this is one of those anecdotal things, you know, 80% of lifespan impacting data is not captured regularly today. If you're just showing up at the doctor's office once or twice a year, they're not measuring as many things as they could be to have predictive value on how long you might actually live. There are huge issues with trust and security focusing around mobility, cloud, and the widespread deployment of medical sensors. And you know, we generally think that this is going to be an area of possibly huge disruption in the wireless universe. And so with that, um, I'll say thank you and uh, take any questions if there's time. We'll take one question. I wish I knew. Yeah, don't, don't know. 
I mean, we're at, we're at this really interesting intersection point where you're just starting to see phones get, you know, sort of like, like the motion, you know, like the M7 chip, the ability to measure just some like 3D spatial kinds of stuff because, you know, that's good. Um, all of the sort of like the medical sensors things, you know, the, the blowing on your phone to be able to sort of, you know, tell what's happening, you know, the chemical sensor stuff, um, you know, having, um, you know, like a, like a square mobile, uh, you know, credit card thing, you know, having a medical sensor thing that, you know, plugs into the port on your phone and, you know, does a blood prick. We're, you know, we're, you know we're, I don't know, we're, you know, half a dozen or ten years away from, from that kind of stuff. But, you know, all of the atomic, tech, all of the core technologies, they're all, they're all in labs, they're all in universities. There's, there's people putting that stuff together. It just seems inevitable that all these things are going to come together and there's just going to be this landslide of data. And then nobody knows what's going to happen. Right. So I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer. It doesn't necessarily sound like, like huge data streams. Uh, much of it can be filtered. Let, Ahmed, it's, it's not necessarily huge data streams. It's huge numbers of people yeah. doing you know, continuous small data streams, which has its own kinds of exactly. novel, novel problems. It's a distributed computing system distributed across everyone's phones. So yeah. each person will process the data and then send the results. Well, we'll see. Um, you know, there's, I, I, Yes, to some extent, you're never ever going to send the completely raw data stuff. But there's really interesting questions about you know how much sort of if you will feature vector extraction you know are we going to do you know from sort of whatever the raw data feed is versus is there more predictive value of sending more of the raw information up for the folks running the big analytics in the cloud? So like, I, you know I don't have any good answers they on like that. The raw stuff. Uh, you talk to doctors and they get real twitchy anytime you use the word lossy, <laughs> right, or selective. Okay. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, so th uh, this is a great question because it, it points to a whole, a whole bunch of things. So you talk to our friends in machine learning, you know, what they, and this is an aspiration, you know, what they constantly say is if we have more data from more time points from more people, right, across more, you know, kind of modalities of use, our ability to push the window, you know, backwards so that we can predict, you know, a day or a week or something, um, can, can only get better. Now, that's, a, that's an aspiration, but it's, it's, not, an, it's not an unreasonable aspiration. Um, you get to, into really interesting questions in sort of the security, privacy, and ethics, right? Um, when am I allowed to do something with this data with or without your permission? When am I, when is it unethical for me not to do something for, too many negatives in this sentence, when is it okay to do something that you have not given me permission for, right? So which is to say, um, your Nike Fit thing suggests that you're about to have a cardiac, you know, in the next four hours. Um, is it okay for Verizon, right, to data mine your stuff and find the closest people in your Facebook friend network and immediately call them and say, go call grandpa? Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, is it ethical to do so? Is it unethical to do so? Is it ethical not to do so? Is it unethical not to do so? <laughs> Welcome to the world, <laughs> right, of being able to sort of monitor and predict. I don't, I don't know what the answers are, but the, you know. The short answer is we uh, predict the yeah. weather, but we can't change it. Yeah. We still like it. <laughs> yeah. Let's thank Rob again. It was thank a you. Our last speaker is uh, one that we love to have go last, and Jeff Andrews is going to be introducing him for us. Uh, just after our last speaker, we'll have